Okay. Well, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me. It's a great honor. Uh, I regret not being able to be there in person, well, uh, but uh, at least, I mean, it's, it's, it's a great opportunity to be able to give this talk to this audience. And uh, uh, yeah, I know, I mean, the, the fo focus, of course, is on, uh, well, the mathematical aspects of different fields, uh, including artificial intelligence, that might be interesting and relevant to the audience. So I will try in this talk to give you uh, some high level overview of some recent exciting topics in the field of AI, of course, with subjective uh, kind of attention paid to what I'm interested in, but it's uh, also quite um, kind of uh, interesting open problems. And I guess I'm trying to basically uh, give people some ideas about where uh, mathematical tools could really make difference and help the field of artificial intelligence to make advances uh, because uh, mostly uh, the students and uh, kind of uh, professors as well are with computer science background and uh, it never hurts to have uh, more kind of powerful tools to do the uh, theoretical analysis, especially in the field of deep learning, where as we all know, uh, the systems get kind of harder and harder to understand and analyzing them is more and more challenging. And I'll try to kind of explain what those open problems could be. So anyway, since uh, then I, I assume that we have an hour and a half, 15 minutes. Uh, so discussion will be, uh, so it's about an hour talk with 15 minute discussion, right? That's hopefully the correct. Sure, that's okay. Okay, so uh, in any case, uh, let me just uh, start with a very high level uh, birds kind of uh, flight uh, level overview of what uh, the field of artificial intelligence was always aiming at. And even one step back, uh, artificial intelligence and primarily machine learning and even statistics like decades ago, if you think about that, the objective of statistics was always generalization. So it could have been a narrower settings where you have a set of, you have a data set, you have uh, IED examples. And you simply want to fit a curve, but you want the curve to extrapolate on the examples, well, supposedly coming from same distribution, but different ones. So you call it generalization. And then machine learning fields come and essentially piggybacks on top of statistics and tries to do the same thing. It's just uh, the data become more complex. They become high dimensional. And instead of curve fitting, well, I mean, you're still fitting curves, but with more sophisticated tools. And essentially deep learning is a, a bit more sophisticated curve fitting than maybe a logistic regression. But essentially it's all about generalization at more and more general levels, pun intended. Because what's going on in the field right now, uh, first we kind of try to come up with methods that will generalize well on the same uh, data distribution, but to unseen samples. Then we start pondering how we make those uh, models generalize out of distribution. Well, whatever that means has to be defined more precisely. I'll Kind of touch upon that later and then you keep going and recent advances uh in large-scale ai systems about which i'm going to talk at the end are quite mind-boggling for example systems like gato uh from deep mind uh that were trained to to do a wide variety of tasks uh from uh looking at images producing text or reading text and uh, generating images answering questions or playing games like Atari. So it's kind of systems becoming more and more versatile or general. And that's in a sense to me, and I think to many in the field is kind of the holy grail of artificial intelligence to try to match human ability to be so versatile, perhaps not necessarily uh, to be the world champion at Go or chess, but be able to learn all those different things that humans do and uh, be extremely general and flexible at adapting to kind of new situations, new skills you have to learn. 
And uh, it's highly, again, imprecise and informal, uh, but kind of intuitive definition that uh, was given, for example, by OpenAI. What do we mean by AGI or artificial general intelligence, which is a topic of uh, lots of debate recently within the field and around the field. Uh, we can say, well, yes, we do want some autonomous system that can do well on most economically valuable work, ideally outperforming humans. So with this goal in mind, um, yeah, I just kind of wanted to note that <laughs> this term of AGI, artificial general intelligence, it's kind of uh, seemed to be a little bit of a controversy uh, for quite a while, at least within our field, because people keep arguing whether it has to be something conscious, it has to have general generality of human, or it's just supposed to be a model that is capable with the same set of weights in a deep network uh, to perform a wide variety of tasks. And I think all these views have, um, some validity, but it's interesting to see uh, kind of AI colleagues to argue about what the definition should be. Uh, in this talk, I'll basically try to cover a few aspects that relate to this goal and uh, uh, from some of those angles. And it's something that at least our uh, group was involved in um, in the past several years. So the topics of continual learning of robust invariant predictive models and out of distribution generalization uh, are all related to the question, how do you make systems that can learn simultaneously or sequentially from a wide variety of different data sets to do wide variety of different tasks. Uh, we're also looking into um, somewhat orthogonal kind of topic, uh, but it also comes to continual learning about how to model uh, using dynamical systems uh, whether analytical or combining them with deep networks, how to model, uh, for example, complex multivariate time series like brain data. I may not have much time to focus on that right now because I want to focus on generalization, robustness, and uh, recent advances in terms of uh, large scale systems getting at generalization uh, much better than anything before. And that's kind of the last topic that I hope to, the neural scaling laws and so-called foundation models, uh, which uh, in the past two years actually um, led to what some people consider a revolution in the field. But it's all, as I said, it's all different aspects of that um, holy grail of reaching uh, generalist agents that can do multiple things, can adapt to new things, and not to forget what they learned before. And with continual learning, like what, what are we talking about? Essentially, you can think about that as uh, sequential online learning in non-stationary environments. I can give probably many, many examples. I don't want to spend too much time on that, but imagine if you want a robot that can uh, perform various things in different environments, learn to perform new commands, be comfortable, quote unquote, uh, switching uh, from inside, indoors to outdoors kind of challenges. You will definitely need a system that is capable of acquiring new knowledge without forgetting what it learned before. Um, Self-driving cars, that's clearly a challenge. I mean, it's very far from being reliable. That's why we're talking about robustness. But you can imagine that environment of driving um, in the country road uh, is quite different in terms of like of what skills and what kind of tasks you need to do effectively from environment of driving on highway and yet different from like driving in the city like San Francisco, New York or Montreal. That's particularly stressful. So on and so forth. I mean, the examples where you need a system that can change uh, what it's doing and adapt to new tasks, new uh, users, in this case, for example, conversational agents, uh, even the same person, the needs of the person change during the day and their uh, personal assistant or chatbot should be able to switch flexibly to all those new things. But the point is it shouldn't forget what learned before. So it shouldn't wash out the knowledge while adapting the weights of the neural network to the new situation. And last but not least, an important application is um, healthcare. 
And in healthcare, particularly, um, uh, the challenge is that it's not very difficult to learn on specific data sets, uh, for example, a particular uh, records, x-rays or medical imaging of brain or so on and so forth, you learn uh, accurate predictor of certain um, abnormality, for example, using the data from a particular hospital, only to learn later that if you use that model and just without kind of any caution apply it to the data from a different hospital, it fails dramatically. Then you try to look into what happened and you see that maybe model was not robust because it didn't learn the important causal or invariant features. And it relied on some spuriously correlated ones, which related to the fact that the first hospital was putting some uh, particular marks on the patient files or something like that. Anyway, so you really want a system that is robust across multiple data and can switch to new ones and still be able to work well on the old ones. So essentially, when this happens in time, uh, when you present with new situations, new data sets over time, uh, that's what's called uh, continual learning setting or lifelong learning setting. And essentially, it's, as I said, uh, the difference between standard machine learning, standard, well, particularly supervised learning and continual learning is as follows. So what is standard setting, classical statistical learning setting? You given data set, uh, say with labeled samples, X as our input um, uh, vectors of data and Ys are their labels, for example, different type of animals and the images. And your model, be it logistic regression or multi-layer neural net, uh, has to fit its parameters from this data so that later on during the test phase, when you see unlabeled samples or images, you can hopefully correctly classify uh, the concept of interest, for example, those animals. But now imagine uh, that your data sets, for example, your images keep changing and uh, you have to kind of learn different concepts from animals to, I don't know, distinguishing different models of car. Uh, you also switch types of images from, um, pictures or photographs to hand-drawn images, uh, you kind of go out of distribution, how they call it in the machine learning field, although obviously you'll have to define the type of the distribution shift. And depending on the type of a shift, you may have to use different methods to handle it. But uh, the challenge is indeed now that you will be present with this uh, sequence of different data uh, supposedly drawn from different data distributions. How different? That's a good question. And how that affects the results is a good question. And the reason I'm mentioning it here as very interesting problem is that continual learning field in machine learning right now is primarily empirical. It's a bit of a like wild west of people inventing algorithms to handle the situation and essentially trying them on uh, various benchmarks, uh, various data sets, but the theory of continual learning is still um, uh, well, it's still lacking to a large extent. I mean, there is a, a little bit of work. So in a sense, I think continual learning, uh, and in any case, like learning um, under uh, non-stationarity in online setting is still a very interesting area where any theoretical contribution would be more than welcome. So basically what we are aiming at uh, in this setting at high level is a so-called notion of transfer. Uh, transfer means that once you learn a model and you keep kind of augmenting, uh, updating it later, you ideally would like um, those shared weights in your neural network to be contributing positively to the performance in the future and also hopefully to avoid interference or forgetting what you learned in the past. So that's what people call a positive or at least non-negative transfer, both in the future and the past. And more specifically what it means, well, if it was not sequential learning, but rather um, kind of simultaneous, more like classical setting that all your diverse data sets, if they all were available at once, 
uh, your life would have been easier because you would formulate your usual objective. Uh, you will define some loss function, which could be either cross entropy in a deep network today, or it could be, uh, I don't know, hinge, law, hinge loss, or it could be some uh, something else. It could be some square loss if it's more of a regression problem, uh, you name it. But define that loss for uh, prediction of the label for a given input vector. You could have, as usual, say that you would aim at uh, minimizing expected loss across all data sets. However, with continual learning, the challenge and kind of the beauty of it uh, is that the data sets appear sequentially. Therefore, uh, you need all kinds of different ways of um, trying to approximate and optimize this objective without having access to all these data sets at the same time. And that's essentially what um, leads to different uh, proposals within continu continual learning field about how to do that. But again, as I said, most of those proposals are practical, algorithmic, like say, keeping replay buffer of most representative samples of the past, which raises question, what samples are most representative, how you measure that, so on and so forth. Are there any guarantees on how well you're going to do uh, using a particular way of ranking of those samples? Other type of methods try to regularize weights. So some of them are remembered better than others and not change as much, uh, so on and so forth. But basically, I'm saying that this is still quite an open problem. And why is it a problem? Here is a very simple example from a relatively old paper, but classical one on uh, EWC, elastic weight consolidation, which shows precisely what the issue with continual learning could be unless you do something about um, not forgetting uh, what's learned before. What normally happens with um, kind of uh, deep networks. You use methods like uh, gradient descent, but stochastically, like you see a new sample or the batch of samples, and you compute the gradient um, uh, of the objective function of the loss function with respect to that point or the kind of average over set of points. And uh, you change your weights according to this gradient, and you keep doing that. So if you use this SGD blue curve here uh, for a while, when the data are IAD, uh, deep, deep network learns good weights typically and uh, then generalizes within distribution. But if you start changing distributions and your uh, data sets uh, are sufficiently different, then what's called catastrophic forgetting starts happening. So basically, the new uh, gradients start looking in the directions that are not so good for preserving uh, kind of performance on the previous data. And the system performance on the old tasks or data sets start degrading. So the whole field is trying to essentially come up with various methods to avoid that. And I'm not going to give the full kind of overview of continual learning here. If you're interested, uh, I mean, there is lots of stuff online. I taught courses on continual learning in the past two years. There is also ICML uh, 2021 tutorial um, with uh, and my colleague, Zen Solomonaka, you can uh, find that. But I think this field, given its practical importance and uh, still very much like algorithmic and uh, empirical nature, I think it's really interesting source of um, problems of more theoretical type where you really would try to understand better and explain uh, what type of interventions could really help achieve the best trade-off between not forgetting or forgetting less while adapting. Uh, okay, so I think I already oops, I had that one. And uh, yeah, probably have to speed up a little bit, but I just kind of wanted to say that many things actually can happen. It's not so simple. It's not just forgetting um, that can happen. That's a, like first scenario in this picture when every time you get a new data set, you train on this data set and start performing well on it, uh, performance on previous, say, two dat data sets uh, goes down. This is classic lack of stability. 
as uh, it's called based on like historical uh, terminology from uh, computational neuroscience uh, and kind of neural networks there because uh, basically the field of uh, artificial neural nets continual learning is really trying to solve uh, what brains seem to be uh, able to do quite successfully, namely the trade-off between uh, stability and plasticity, where stability is uh, various forms of memory, while plasticity is various forms of adaptation. But as I said, there are many scenarios, uh, lack of plasticity or ossifying is another situation where you may learn really well on a data set, but you may fall deep into some local optimum. So you are unable, no matter what new data you see, to adapt to new tasks and you just don't learn them. Understanding when it happens and how to prevent it, good question. Again, mainly treated uh, empirically, algorithmically, um, this insufficient understanding of how the dynamics of the solutions and the properties of the uh, landscape of that loss function, how all that depends on the model architecture, on the problem at hand, and so on and so forth. Uh, there could be, of course, stability and plasticity. That's what we would like. KC, uh, you adapt, you don't forget. And it could be even like an ideal utopian type of situation with continual learning where you not only not forget, you improve your performance on the previous tasks and data sets while you keep learning and you improve performance on the future tasks. And obviously uh, this depends not just on your method and uh, network architecture, it depends to a large extent on your data and um, figuring out appropriate metrics of diversity across data sets and figuring out how they relate to predicting which of the situations you're going to have is, again, a very good open theoretical question. Anyway, so I think it's a, it's a really a, a very rich field with a bunch of open uh, and also quite practical important problems. Uh, just to give some idea what uh, people usually try to uh, keep in mind when coming up with different approaches, uh, essentially, you would like to, um, to achieve transfer from the previously learned to kind of a new task. Uh, essentially, you would like to make sure that when your neural network is changing its weights, when you compute gradients doing your optimization, uh, your gradients are um, kind of aligned across different data distributions, then making a step with respect to the gradient on the new data point will not uh, decrease the performance on the old data point and kind of vice versa. So that's kind of one of the key leading uh, principles that people try to keep in mind, but then I mean, there are many more details in terms of how exactly you implement this principle. Okay, so I'm kind of uh, wrapping up, I think with uh, continual learning field. And I'm um, just trying to see how much time I left. Uh, and uh, just wanted to say that um, not only uh, kind of supervised continual learning is full of open questions, even more practical and uh, uh, challenging is a field of uh, continual reinforcement learning. So essentially, um, as we know, I mean, supervised learning uh, essentially asks you to just ask your classifier or agent to make a decision about how to label the input vector of data. While reinforcement learning is much more generic um, setting where agent is taking an action. Well, it could be classification action, but it could be an action in a computer game. It could be an action of producing a sentence in dialogue and so on and so forth. While the action in that case changes the environment in which the agent acts. In supervised um, uh, learning, nothing happens with uh, images of animals if you correctly or incorrectly classify the previous one. While in reinforcement learning, your action affects environment, which affects your future actions and uh, dependencies are 
clearly much more complicated. So when you put the agent, reinforcement learning agent in the continual or non-stationary setting, uh, you can only imagine that things become even more um, difficult to analyze and or develop better methods for handling non-stationarities in uh, reinforcement learning. Again, I mean, there is lots of work in this field. It's very, uh, I mean, it's relatively recent and it's hard. We had the survey trying to cover all the recent kind of um, problem formulations and uh, proposed approaches, existing benchmarks. Uh, you're welcome to uh, take a look and also, I mean, uh, try to characterize what properties of um, non-stationarity, what kind of non-stationarities you uh, basically can have and what effect it can have on performance of your agent. And uh, there is interesting recent work from our group on the mixing times, um, because essentially, yeah, uh, that's, that's what determines uh, the performance of the agent trying to learn policy in this non-stationary environment. Again, as I said, I'm going very high level today and just giving you some taste of different uh, subfields where um, there are many more open, interesting questions than there are theoretical answers. To change the gears, uh, as I uh, was mentioning, like we aim at generalization which is in a sense not orthogonal but closely related also to notion of robustness invariance and uh, being able to handle out of distribution samples or kind of data sets uh, basically like whether you can still generalize when environment changed due to either statistical or potentially adversarial actions so for example we have seen many, many examples when deep learning, unlike uh, us, uh, kind of uh, imperfect humans, nevertheless, deep learning breaks dramatically in very seemingly like innocent situations, the adversarial noise. So you can construct noise that can be added to images, which human eye will not detect. And yet, like in this, picture on the left, uh, deep networks may be completely um, kind of dysfunctional, unable to properly classify those images anymore. Just one of many, many, many examples. I mean, there are surveys on this topic and so on and so forth. It's a well-known issue for quite a few years, which led to the whole field of so-called adversarial robustness. And adversarial robustness essentially uh, um, states the problem as follows. So uh, you assume that you have your classifier and there is some uh, boundary which separates uh, samples and in the input space into say two classes. And you could learn that classifier from training data uh, efficiently, for example. But the question remains, um, if someone will kind of shift samples on purpose in certain way, uh, that kind of tries to confuse your um, neural network. Will you be able to still perform robustly or not and how to achieve it? And there are various, I mean, it's a big field on its own. There are various attempts. Uh, there is lots of prior work. This is kind of even relatively old by now. But the idea usually in such works is that when we train classifier, we try to optimize for its accuracy on training data, which is the first term um, in this kind of minimization of this ob objective. But we also add now as regularizer additional objective that tries to ensure robustness, which basically tries to make sure that even uh, if kind of decision boundary like shifted somewhat, uh, your model can still not fail dramatically at least. However, um, unlike that prior work, uh, what we kind of observed in the, uh, our recent paper that came out last December uh, at New Rips, uh, it was a very nice collaboration with my colleagues from McGill, uh, Hoya, Ashivan, and uh, some students. Uh, the gist of this observation was that perhaps you can get even more robust neural nets 
if you focus on optimizing not the final performance of the classifier uh, with those regularizers I mentioned, but rather you focus on obtaining high-level representations, essentially the last layers of your uh, deep neural network that are insensitive to those adversarial perturbations of input. So focusing on making representations without any particular classification in mind, focusing on making them robust turned out to be actually leading to much, much more um, kind of stable models that are able to withstand a much wider range of perturbations of different kind. Um, again, if you're interested, you more than welcome to look at that paper. But uh, what was quite nice about this observation was that the standard approaches to robustness that aim to make uh, the final objective kind of good, the final uh, task of classification to be robust, are not as robust as this intermediate objective of making representation stable. And this plot was essentially showing uh, uh, how green line, which was this uh, representation focused uh, robustness improvement, how that will withstand increasing uh, uh, strengths of particular type of attack here and how unfortunately um, standard state of art methods were um, breaking much earlier. Again, so all the details are in that paper, but the adversarial robustness is definitely very practical field, very important field. And um, understanding again, what type of methods, what type of regularizers, uh, what uh, can maximally improve robustness to what type of attacks. And there are, there's this whole zoo of different adversarial attacks. This is always an interesting question. Uh, moreover, um, interesting question, is, uh, as I will mention a little bit later about scale of the model, how that affects uh, robustness, like what uh, what happens if the model size increases? Is there any sweet trade-off between the model size and the properties of data that would guarantee a more robust performance of your network? And there is some interesting work by Sebastian Bubik and his colleagues um, that is somewhat related to what I'm going to talk later to some sharp transitions in properties of those uh, networks at scale. Talking about robustness, um, I mentioned um, changes which are kind of adversarial and uh, made on purpose to fool the system, but it doesn't even have to be this way, even just the uh, kind of more innocent statistical changes to the data, simple distribution shifts are quite a serious concern. This is a classical uh, proverbial example of cows on the green pastures, which was quite <laughs> commonly used in uh, deep learning field in the past two years. And the story goes as uh, there was one of the earlier papers where it was demonstrated that if you train image classifier on some standard uh, databases of images, uh, it might not perform well out of distribution. Uh, and this particular example was that, uh, say, it uh, learns to recognize cows, but most of the cows are on green pastures in most of the images in training data. And if the test data go out of distribution in a sense that the background changed to like cows on the beach, that's where deep network was failing drastically, just like the example I mentioned earlier. It was very similar type of failure. Network that did not uh, extract actual uh, features of the animal, but relied on spuriously correlated features of the environment, like the color of background. That the same thing that happened with a network that was uh, accurately classifying x-rays on the data from a particular hospital only to break dramatically when the data were switched to uh, images from another hospital. And that kind of raised concern in the field. And there were papers written about uh, deep networks known to be uh, shortcut learners. So they are in a sense like a lazy students who study to the test and rely on whatever features that can help them pass the test well. 
but those features not necessarily uh, uh, contribute to like deep understanding of the subject or in this case they don't contribute to the understanding of the concept of animal and uh, usually those kind of features are easier like just the background color they're much easier to latch on for deep network and do well as long as the data stay in distribution. Anyway, there are many there are many papers along those lines. It's a very interesting subfield yeah. of this out of distribution or systematic generalization. And um, one of the uh, kind of key papers in the field that appeared like actually summer 2019, it pretty much generated the whole subfield of invariant prediction and methods for doing so. And I just wanted to mention it here because uh, quite a few papers from uh, not just our lab, but from uh, Mila in general, they all kind of uh, were inspired by this work. And the idea here was uh, to follow so-called invariance principle in causality, which essentially says that um, you're trying to learn um, deep network, you're trying to learn representation of last layer so that it will be still uh, kind of robust or invariant and related to the concept of interest like animal, even if the environment or data distribution will change. So motivation is pretty much coming from the objective of inferring the laws of nature which are invariant like no matter what is a setting the gravity law remains so here people try to formalize it and said basically if you have multiple different environments or distributions of data but they have a common uh, relationship between certain hidden features like properties of animal and the concept of animal so that part should remain and you hope to extract those hidden features by learning those uh, invariant predictors. And essentially one way to formulate it was to say that, okay, so let's try to learn a deep network uh, across these multiple different data distributions, but sharing some invariant relationship uh, between hidden features and the target variable. And when we kind of consider this uh, different environments and data distributions simultaneously, we'll try to learn one model that will have the uh, last layer features so that there exists a single common optimal predictor, in this case, just a linear classifier on top of that. So then it essentially would uh, can be shown that that means we um, inferred our invariant or even like you could call them causal features. So it's a, almost like a working definition of causality through principle of invariance. And this work uh, generated lots of follow-up work. We added our two cents to that as well with this um, paper by our a postdoc last year in uh, December, also in the New Rips conference, Kartik Kartikahuja, who essentially provided a theoretical analysis of some failure modes uh, because though the invariant risk minimization was very inspiring and promising, it did have multiple failure modes, and some of them were happening uh, with uh, when you switch from kind of regression to classification problems. Uh, in any case, uh, it turns out that uh, you may need additional constraints besides the constraints imposed by invariant risk minimization in order to be actually able to uniquely find your uh, invariant features. And um, information bottleneck type of a constraint happened to be quite useful. Again, the paper goes into details and analyzes like when the failure modes what, what can happen and why information bottleneck uh, can uh, help uh, kind of alleviate this issue. Again, what I'm trying to say, uh, this whole uh, area of trying to find out how can one learn a model that is stable or robust, or at least representations are stable and robust across uh, different so-called environments or data distributions that are different but have that 
a common relationship between some, say, essential features of animal and the concept. Yeah, so basically, uh, um, there are many methods they're trying to kind of different um, to approach the problem from different sides, and it's not always clear. As I said, there is lots of open questions about theoretically understanding when they're gonna work. Will they work better than just doing the empirical risk minimization? Do you really need particular regularizers? Which regularizers are better than others? Again, um, it, it, it's, not, it's not so trivial. Like another related uh, method uh, called invariant learning consistency, it's again uh, was a quite a different approach motivated by the same problem. And it also generated lots of uh, follow-up work, including like lots of work in our group. And essentially it was trying to, again, formulate the problem of how one can learn a model that is stable, performing well across quite different data sets, assuming there is something in common in those data distributions that can be captured. And their classical example was uh, actually also quite relevant to continual learning setting. Um, it was basically saying that if you have simultaneously available multiple different data sets and you aim for the average loss picture on top, you may find good solution, but if the data sets are presented sequentially, like in continual learning, or in general, if during training you have one type of data, I know, mainly containing cows on green pasture, and during the test situation, there is distribution shift or so-called out of distribution setting, then you might not necessarily always uh, be able to find that um, solution without knowing all uh, different data sets that uh, need to be taken into account. And the example was basically saying that there are two minima, two good solutions in the loss landscape for neural network. If you know the future out of distribution uh, kind of type of data. And if you don't, then the loss landscape uh, for one data set and for another data set look like the two pictures here. It was kind of main motivating example of this uh, ILC approach. And then the chances of finding that solution on the top are pretty much zero because there is this very long and deep ravine with many different good solutions. And how do you know uh, where is the one that will be stable? And so the question was like, what do you do about that? How do you know that uh, the local minimum in the left bottom corner would be stable while the other guys will not? So they try to formulate the criterion that you can um, try to test during the uh, stochastic gradient search. Uh, essentially, they ended up with more a heuristic approach, which worked well, but figuring out properties of that approach and explaining when it works and doesn't still remains open question. Well, the approach was very simple, essentially. Whenever you take gradients over your data points, say within the mini batch, uh, instead of taking average, you, instead of taking like logical or in a sense, you take logical end. You only take steps in those particular coordinates of that gradient where most of the data points agree that that's a good direction. And if there is much disagreement, you just simply do not use uh, that, uh, that coordinate of the gradient. You don't do anything in that direction. Again, as I said, it worked well in practice and left people with many questions about how to analyze properties of this type of an end mask. And uh, there is still kind of uh, uh, follow up work on that and uh, it's, it's not completely figured out. Just, just yet another example. And finally, uh, let me see how much time. Uh, yeah, I think I'm getting close to the uh, end of the hour. The last well, you, you've got is... 15 minutes for your own okay. forecast. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I don't know what would be better to take question in the middle or maybe leave them for the end. 
because in a sense i really want to cover this part this is this is the most recent and well I, if you really want to sure yeah it's it's quite an exciting thing it's what's happening in the field and partially this is the reason i wasn't able to make it to the uh to uh, i mean to the symposium in person because in all this uh, neural scaling uh, kind of uh, craze recently there are also lots of efforts on uh, well i'm jumping ahead of myself how to uh, obtain more compute for open source ai communities and uh, there are various companies that are trying to help uh, open source communities and academia to get compute to catch up with advances in uh, ai industry i'll explain like what's going on and one of those companies, Stability.ai, is having launch party tonight uh, in San Francisco, and it's quite a big event. <laughs> that's that's why I'm here rather than being in Toronto. But yeah, uh, what can you do? We didn't clone ourselves yet. So what about the neural scaling revolution that everyone, at least in AI field, is talking about? And you probably might have seen uh, lots of uh, news about large-scale AI models doing things that uh, they never could achieve before. You probably have seen that by now it's not, it's, it's old news, uh, GPT-3, Clip, DALI, more recently DALI-2, and most recently, well, stable diffusion uh, product from this stability.ai company that I just mentioned, and the list goes on. Those are examples of very large scale models. By that, I'll, I'll show a graph, essentially orders of magnitude larger than anything trained before. Trained on, again, extremely large amount of data. So basically it's a change in scale within a few last years, which seem to be leading to considerable improvement in performance and generalization. That holy grail of the field I was talking about in the beginning, uh, that everyone was usually claiming that we have narrow AI being able to do really well, very specific things, play Go, play chess, so on and so forth, but we don't have generalist AI that can easily, out of distribution, adapt very quickly and do totally new things. And it seems like scaling relatively simple transformer architectures, again, I'll talk a bit more about that, it seems to be bridging that gap recently at increasing speed. That's why I think all this excitement and uh, even like calling it like neural scaling revolution. So um, what about those models? I mean, there is a good overview, uh, which is again, by now it's <laughs> already old. It's from August uh, previous year from Stanford called foundation models, basically opportunities and risks of foundation models. The overview, uh, basically presents all these recent advances in large scale models and language, well, GPT-3, many others uh, that uh, probably you have seen uh, in uh, various news articles, how well they can generate uh, essays, well, with some human help and not always ideally, but still quite impressive. Um, all the articles about students using GPT-3 or even previous version, to do their assignments at school or at university. And more recently, like Codex and Copilot generating code automatically, things changing rapidly. Clip, DALI, stable diffusion, and so on seem to produce very high quality, novel, creative images based on the text prompts. And that seems to be completely like revolutionizing art uh, with all kinds of controversial discussions, whether the artist going to be out of job and whether the writer is going to be out of job. I don't think so. And many people think it's going to be just very useful tools that are going to augment writers and artists capabilities. But anyway, things change very quickly and they changed apparently primarily due to increase in scale, which seemed to be quite a brute force approach to solving the problem of generalization. And yet it seems to be that something is happening that is clear transition 
or transformation of quantity into quality. Um, an example of this GPT-3 language model is an, essentially it's autoregressive model uh, that essentially learns conditional probability distribution of next talking, well, next word, given sufficiently large window uh, of previous kind of uh, words of the text. Uh, the fact that the transformers is relatively novel architecture being used uh, is handy because transformers, unlike some other autoregressive temporal kind of neural networks like LSTM before, uh, they have this uh, so-called attention mechanism. And essentially attention mechanism, just like sparsity, L1 regularization and all other things in sparse modeling before, they allow you to learn predictor in this case, like autoregressive model, while at the same time select most relevant inputs from potentially very long history. So they kind of specify um, your input and um, that allows them to pick very long range dependencies sometimes. And perhaps that contributes to the fact that the text generated using such models uh, seems to make more sense than before because you do need to model some long range semantic dependencies to kind of produce uh, decent text. But note that uh, in terms of scale, the GPT-3 uh, used 175 billion parameters. It was released in, uh, I think, May, June, 2020. So it's been more than two years ago. By now there are larger models and there are better performing models. And there is this whole, industry of <laughs> competing large-scale um, language models but the surprise there was that it was so huge it was orders of magnitude more than previously kind of uh, constructed models and why it was interesting the uh, paper the gpt3 paper essentially was called uh, that large-scale language models are few short learners if you recall, being able to generalize out of distribution or work well on like some previously unseen data and tasks, or maybe to be a bit more lenient, to be able to adapt to them in few shots, that was that, well, holy grail, everybody was aiming at with different methods. And uh, whether you consider the methods such as invariant risk minimization or anything else, or you just use a standard SGD, and you just increase the model size, apparently this brute force approach um, achieved quite impressive improvements in generalization. And that was kind of one of the classical plots from the GPT-3 paper, uh, essentially showing what happens when you scale, for example, amount of data and the model size, how you experience like a huge jump in the accuracy due to scale in model size. Well, and of course you need uh, appropriate scaling in terms of data the model is trained on to basically maintain that balance between amount of information in the data, which is very crudely approximated by size of the data, assuming that you sample the data from the internet sufficiently kind of uniformly and the model capacity, which is crudely approximated by the model size. So this type of behavior was kind of claimed to fame by uh, those large scale models. And then it opened the whole stream of uh, models being not necessarily language based, multimodal, text to images, DALI, and more recent kind of successors, uh, as I mentioned, stable diffusion, is quite popular now and it's pretty much in the same family though using different uh, algorithms to generate images and uh, what was impressive was essentially the quality of images and the correctness of like understanding the uh, prompt given in english like exact same cat on top of a sketch on the bottom and the system seem to kind of quote unquote understand the request and indeed draw the cat based on the image above. It really was never done before 
those uh, those uh, kind of large scale multimodal models started appearing. The opposite was also quite interesting. Uh, so called clip system both came out of OpenAI initially. Uh, but I'll mention there are many more efforts now from not just other companies, but from uh, open source communities and uh, academia starting to catch up. But unfortunately, just starting. Uh, images to text. Uh, Clip essentially uh, takes images and generates their description. And the interesting thing is it did demonstrate zero shot, which means like no uh, even samples from the new data to adapt to just out of distribution generalization to the data that looked sufficiently different from uh, kind of the data it was trained on. Comparing to state of art methods that were smaller and uh, were not trained on this uh, large variety of diverse data, like larger, smaller scale of data, smaller scale of model. Those just did not generalize like this uh, state of art uh, ResNet uh, 101 trained on ImageNet could not uh, have any out of distribution generalization. It was like low accuracy of say 2.7%. At the same time, this clip pre trained on large variety of data and sufficiently large scale was getting to 77%. Intuitively, what was happening perhaps is. Uh, the system were somehow, first of all, having diverse data to cover different parts of the all possible image distributions. And perhaps it was extracting some uh, quote unquote independent components that later on could have been recombined to uh, cover the case of data never seen before. But again, this is somewhat hand wavy intuitive explanation of what could have been happening, so-called compositional generalization, which means uh, extracting from the data, not necessarily linear components, but uh, and not necessarily linearly recombined components, but still loosely speaking, components that can be used later on to form, uh, to, to work well on the new data. And uh, this was unsupervised, uh, kind of setting, um, just like uh, large language models. And that was a thing that uh, all those models were not trained specifically to do specific tasks. They were just kind of trained to represent well the wide variety of data trained to learn their kind of uh, distribution. And then when specific question, task or whatever arrives, they were able to adapt to it quickly. Okay, just to try to wrap up a little bit and get to the most recent open questions about how to model it all. Um, I mean, I just give example of anthropic, uh, but it's a, a line of thinking now of many people that large scale neural networks are essentially complex systems. Doesn't matter they are artificial, they could be physical or biological. Uh, bottom line, they start exhibiting perhaps some properties of complex systems uh, that we could study. And since they are so difficult, I mean, to study theoretically, perhaps we can study them empirically, just like statistical physics try to uh, characterize large scale uh, networks of interacting particles and come up with relationship between that level interactions and the higher level like thermodynamics, uh, the uh, measures of performance of the system at higher level. So indeed, when this type of thinking was applied to large scale models, there was this famous paper um, actually uh, by a statistical physicist, Jared Kaplan, who now um, is co-leading this anthropic company, uh, who was working with OpenAI to build GPT-3, where this empirical science of large scale system and the so-called discovered scaling laws helped to build more effective GPT-3. They actually used it when building GPT-3. And let me just explain, because this is a basic um, classical observation. Uh, by now, it's uh, two year old already. But that kind of generated this whole uh, neural scaling laws kind of excitement in the field, where we still, as I said, need more theoretical understanding of what affects parameters of these laws. But 
to understand what those straight lines mean, essentially, um, it was shown on multiple orders of magnitude that when you increase the compute uh, allowed to train, for example, GPT-3, and not constraining data or parameter uh, size, basically choosing the best you can get for this amount of compute, uh, you would get a power law decrease in the loss, the test loss of the system. So performance uh, will be improving according to power law, uh, which correspond to the straight line on log log plot. And the beauty of that was that it's, first of all, also applied to uh, scaling with respect to other variables of interest. Second plot shows data set size and data set size growing while model and compute are unrestricted or not bottlenecked. And again, performance in form of test loss improves according to power law, just with different parameters. And yet another example was same thing happens with um, size of the model or number of parameters being on x-axis, while the data set size and compute being unconstrained. Again, you choose the best. So this was interesting, extremely interesting empirical observation, because once you manage to fit those parameters from the data and start predicting performance, scale to which you didn't get to, it gives you a tool of deciding which choice of architecture, training algorithm, data selection process, or something like that, which one scales better, which one has better exponent. And you invest in that approach. And that's quite useful. For example, it was used during training GPT-3, and it's obviously quite useful in uh, any uh, question in machine learning whenever you compare two methods, two models, and so on and so forth. And that was a classical example where looking at scale and the plots comparing the performance not at particular data set or benchmark like people usually do in machine learning and not for maybe the models of a fixed size, but rather looking at how the performance uh, scales, say in this case with the data, gives you interesting insight that in this case contradicted the common knowledge. For years, convolutional networks were considered pretty much state of art way to go when uh, building image models. And indeed, they were outperforming this new um, vision transformer type of ar architectures, which didn't have any specific knowledge about uh, convolutions being uh, kind of good way of capturing image properties. They were more generic uh, type of models, right? Okay, um, can, can we, can we right have leave time for questions? Sure, okay. Basically, this is kind of the plot showing that performance uh, can reverse, and you want to know that because you, know, you need to know where to invest at scale. So that's kind of the main thing. And uh, I very, briefly within one minute want to mention that there are much more interesting things happening beyond scaling laws now and they relate to the phase transitions or abrupt behaviors abrupt changes in performance at scale which are not well understood which are happening in compute in data and in model size increase they are found in various different tasks with di different models. There are many examples. There are many recent papers. There is open question about mechanistic interpretation of those. Uh, our recent work tries to capture a more generic, more universal family of scaling laws, uh, which can look into inflection points, transitions, potentially non-monotonic behavior. And they seem to be indeed more generally capturing more complex situations, but understanding what's going on is still lacking. And probably that's where I'm gonna uh, end so people can ask questions.